Right, everybody knows John Gottley, who's come to see me today, so we thought we'd talk you through a few things. But first, an announcement. We've reached a benchmark this week. The 200th Blueprint Practitioner has been trained. So we've, we've hit a major milestone there, so we're both really happy. So what we're going to talk about first is the dreaded smoking, something that lots of therapists shy away from, will not touch, and generally because they've had massive fails. John does quite a lot with it. He's quite adept, having been doing this for, what, 20? Nearly. Something years. Um, so we're just gonna we're just gonna go through that. So smokers, the dreaded smokers. You do quite well with them, I understand. It's a big market. There's a lot of smokers in the country, a lot of them want to give up. The reasons for giving up are a bit diverse, but for many people it's costing them a minor fortune. Yeah. Um just last May I had somebody spending seven hundred pounds a month on fags. A month. A month. I don't pounds. even know how many packets that is. But, but that isn't even the most I've had. Um, and that's probably 40-something. Um, wow. If I'm actually honest, I ought to go and look at and see how much a packet of fags is these days. I know it's around a tenner, but I don't yeah. know exactly because I actually gave up 32 years ago. Right. Well done. Um, it's a lot of money. It's now antisocial because they have to go out to the pub while all their mates talk about them. Um, yeah, there's a lot of places you can't smoke, um, and then of course there's health, all the problems associated with it. So, so if a client comes to, if a prospective client comes to you, hi, is that John the hypnotist? Can you make me stop smoking? Do you have a client selection process to to minimise client fails? I do. I I do ask people. <laughs> The only real one is, well, the main one is, I suppose there's three actually, is why do you want to give up smoking? Mm -hmm. I do like it to be um, a, a sensible reason for themselves. I mean, to give an example, I, when I asked that question to a man and uh, one some time ago, and he said, because my son is six, which seemed a bit of a strange answer. <laughs> So because I, the sky is blue. So I said to him, <clears throat> what significance is that? And he said, well, that's the age I was when my father died. I'm uh, smoking. So right. that was yes, come in there. They've got to be ready to immediately write the check out. Yeah. Which is, of course, substantially more than what a normal fee is. And the question, the last question is, when do you want to give up? And any answer other than no, and there'll be a back out the door holding their check again. Yeah. They've got to give the, the answer now. Yeah. Um, for me to deal with them. So that's all. I, so if they say, if they say, oh, sometime in the next month. Do you just see that as somebody not committed, somebody that's just going to drift on and on I, and on? I basically and this say, month becomes next month and next month becomes never. Yeah, I will say to them, okay, come back when you're ready, and I've never seen one of those since. Right. Okay. I think I've got, I think got 100% pure record that anybody that's ever said that has never come back. Yeah. Because tomorrow is always another day. Yeah. And so it goes on. And I mean, I do actually know one or two people that have said this, you know, I'll come see you. And they're still smoking. Yeah. You know, three, four years ago, some of them. Um, but I find that's the same with everything. It's the same with weight loss. People say, oh, I'll get back to you. You know, yeah, I really want some help. I'll phone you next week. Yeah. I haven't heard from them. Yeah. Um, so I've what? actually got a couple of those on the go at the moment. But yeah. I've got another one actually with pain um, that keeps saying she's going to come and see me, but she never wants to see me when I when she's in pain. She says it's too much to get round to me. And the trouble is, I always say to her, "Well, I want you in pain because then you know that I've fixed it or not." Yeah. I yeah. It's I don't want you when you're feeling perfectly alright. It's fine with yeah. my algae, which is. Ah, uh, okay. I said, I don't want you on a good day because I don't know whether I've done anything. I yeah. don't like taking money for nothing. Yeah. How do you calibrate somebody who isn't yeah. in pain? How much pain are you in today on a scale of zero to ten? Zero. Yeah. Okay, so how will you know when your pain's gone? <laughs> well, that's actually, that is actually a question on my intake sheet, is how will you know when I've fixed you? Yeah. 
And it seems to be about the hardest question from some of the answers I get. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> don't know. Great. Um, so a, a smoke has passed your SAS selection process. Uh, where do you where do you start with them? Actually, sitting down, I usually say to them, have a couple of other things. If they're really anxious, as some people occasionally are, if it's if they're really anxious and you can see them sitting in the chair, sort of fidgeting, shaking, I will actually just try and wrong foot them. I'll say, look, there's no rule that says you can't have fun in the therapy room. What's the funniest thing you've ever seen or done? And you could jowl something out of them. Very few people answer straight away, but sort of, what sort of comedians might make you laugh? What comedy shows? Just an icebreaker. Tell me something funny from it. Because <clears throat> simply, if you try and tell something that made you wet yourself laughing, if you try and tell somebody else that, yeah. you are laughing at the same time. Yeah. And all I do is, well, as soon as I've got the laugh out of them, I say, just look, that's how quickly your brain can change things. A few moments ago, you were obviously shaking in fear or anxious or something like that. Now you're laughing. Yeah. Every movement, every thought has it associated with a neurotransmitter. You changed your brain state. You changed your yeah. brain chemicals, which is the main reason why chemical imbalance for depression or anxiety is a load of rubbish. Being polite for a video. <laughs> We'd normally say, <laughs> normally say a word associated with Liberal Democrats yeah. and Brexit. <laughs> um, there. So the other way is if they sort of like seem quite relaxed, I'll just say, let's get the worst bit out of the way first and I hand them my intake form. That would come after I've made them laugh if they were of the anxious yes. type. But to say, let's get the worst bit out. So they fill it out. And one of the questions is, why are you here? So nine times out of 10, they'll write something to the effect of to stop smoking. Yeah. So then a bit of acting, I will take the form, pretend to read it. I will be checking it just for sort of like antipsychotic drugs on there. There's questions about that as well. But I'll then look at them and say, you want to stop smoking? I go, yes. You do? Yes. But you've already stopped. When I said, tend to get this blank look, have I? Or something like that? Yeah, you've already stopped. You're not smoking now, are you? That usually leads to a sort of confused look. Some people actually say, well, I didn't know I could smoke in here. I said, well, I haven't said you can't, but um, yeah, I'm a bit more worried about some of them. But, but yeah, you get this confused look. So you're not smoking now. You've already stopped. And I really quite labour that. And then I say to them, so what you're actually telling me is, it's not that you want to stop smoking, you don't want to start smoking. Got you. Yeah, because every time you've stubbed that cigarette out, you've stopped. You've stopped smoking. Technically, you've stopped smoking. Okay. Yeah, and every time you light one, you start it again. So then we'll take them back to their first cigarette, which typically um, is in their school years. Yeah. Usually, I mean, virtually all smoking is actually about some form of social anxiety. Yeah. To be with the big fitting kids in, at school, that's right. fitting with the cool kids, yeah. around the back, <clears throat> back of the bike sheds or out in the woods or whatever, 13, 14, maybe even younger or older, but there's very few people will go into a shop at 13, buy a packet of cigarettes and go and just smoke one on their own in the woods. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In the woods, there's a whole set of images there. <laughs> well, I was just trying to get somewhere where nobody was there. It doesn't happen. Yeah. It's to be with the big kids. Yeah, it is. And the very first cigarette, it isn't pleasant. But the moment they take it back into their lungs, they usually choke, the taste is pretty foul, um, and they cough the guts up. <coughs> no, I haven't been smoking, excuse me. <laughs> Um, it, they're, they're actually trying not to choke in front of the other people yep. they're really struggling with it there. and by weeding this out of them by getting them to sort of tell you about it you're reliving that first cigarette which is actually a trauma horrible yeah. it's actually a trauma in effect yeah 
and there. So then I will then say to them, so if you could go back as an adult, as you are now, and talk to that child who's about to light up the cigarette, what would you say to them? And inevitably the answer is don't start. Yeah, it's the only answer you're ever going to get, isn't it? So, if they want to give up at this anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so then I say, now all you've got to do, basically, is think. Next time you light up, what advice would you be giving that child? Because it's only children that smoke, not adults. I borrowed that from Justin Trans, just in case he ever sees this video. I'll give him the credit of that one, because yet, 99% of everybody that you see smoking will have started in their child years up to in the school years. Yeah. Very, very rare. I do know two people that have started after the age of 20, but that's my lot. That's unusual. Very unusual. Um, so Justin Franz says, children smoke, adults don't. And yeah, we use that. Um, so <clears throat> then, of course, we... Um, have to sort of embed it in hypnotically but that's yeah. where all the hypnosis is going to go into just reinforcing every time you try and light up a cigarette you're going to have this thing going on there don't start yeah you know it's horrible so um, you've messed with the head so all that has been done purely consciously yeah. there's no hypnosis whatsoever yeah um I will then quite often do the swan, which if anybody knows the swan, they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, once again, nothing works for So everybody. what's the context of the swan and how do, you, how do you set it up with the client so they don't, so they don't just think, what on earth's going on here? Um, well, usually, you see, I say sort of like, um, when you're thinking of a cigarette, you often, for the past week before you came here, say, you've been saying, I've got to give up. I know I've got to give up. And then you found yourself in the fag shop buying some more cigarettes. So the problem is actually, you don't know why you've been buying more cigarettes because you want to give up consciously. The problem's inside you. You don't seem to be able to control it. Yeah, it's a subconscious problem. Not a conscious problem, it's a subconscious problem. So that's the guy I want to speak to. And I say, just say to them, one way we can do that is to put your hand like this. Just relax it completely. Let me do my job. I don't want you to fight me. I don't want you to assist me either. And then we go into the swan. And if they're good swanners, we will be able to get yes and no signals and possibly even um, don't know signals. And if they're really, really good, we can actually even get them to do unconscious voice as well. But that's probably not needed. Um, if people don't know the swan, they could use ordinary IMRs. I just don't like them quite as much. Yeah. Um, there so if you can get the person knowing because the swan is fully conscious that their subconscious has agreed to stop you smoking it's agreed to stop you smoking now um you're three quarters of the way there you're probably actually 99 percent of the way there so you, you establish what the yes or no responses yeah, are you establish yes and no response so what's your line of questioning then it's very basic actually is i ask if the part that i'm talking to is responsible for smoking the smoking if that's a no response i ask if we can speak to the part that is we get that up and then we basically say subconscious or that part within the subconscious can you stop this person smoking is it in your remit get a yes okay can you so you can stop them smoking can you stop them smoking now? That's an important question. And what response do you use to, do you, you typically get? You typically get a yes at that point, but you can get a no. And this is quite informative because if, it's, if it says yes, can you stop them smoking now? Yes. So I then just say, can you tell me when you've done it? You get another yes. So you've got three yeses there. Yes set building. Yeah. <laughs> Then if they don't stop smoking, when you get them back in again, if you have to do a rerun, you can literally get that, that part back again and smack the table a few times so and it, say, what part of stop this yeah. guy didn't you understand? So if you, just backtracking a little bit, so if you get your three yeses, 
is that you done? No, I, because it, <laughs> usually because you've you've taught you that's taken up probably an absolute maximum of about twenty minutes. Yeah, and if you do that sort of thing, somebody sits there and thinks, "Well, I thought I paid for an hour. I want two thirds of my money back." Yeah, um, we're British. It's the British people, so you pad it out then for an hour. Yeah, I, I tend, tend to do traditional bit of hypnosis, give them down there, give them some reinforcing scripts, yeah, give them some ego boosting or whatever stuff for yeah. social anxiety and confidence and stuff like that but i know that it's already been done before the work has yeah. already actually been done but i'm just like a convincer. that's a dazzlingly simple approach to using it as a, a convincer now of course if you get the no response to can you do it now this is the gritty stuff this yeah. is the gritty stuff this is where the problems start. the subconscious has told you it can stop them smoking but it's not going to do it now so now comes a negotiation because there's something in the way. The person is getting something from the smoking. So it might be they've got a very stressful job. They have to think a lot. They do um, a lot of problem solving and quite often their mind's going round. They know they've got to solve a problem, but they just can't see it. So they go off and have a cigarette, come back and they spot the solution and boom it's done and the brain thinks smoking cigarette solve problem now of course okay. any decent hypnotherapist knows that it wasn't the cigarette that solved the problem it was the break <laughs> it was the pattern interrupt. yeah yeah but clients don't know about pattern interrupts yeah so if you get the no at that point you have to um go and negotiate find out what the person or what the subconscious is getting from the smoking and then do whatever therapy needs to be done to unravel, uh, unravel the issue. Whether it's stress at work, it might be stress at home, it might be, uh, there might be some quite strong anchors, it may be some habitual stuff. Um, one, <laughs> Sorry, go on. one smoker I had lived quite near me and he worked, because um, I'm from Newbury, he worked in Southampton for B&Q, where the head office is, or just outside Southampton, a little place called Chandlersford. And in driving there, it's about 30 odd miles. He told me he always lit a cigarette at the roundabout where Newbury College is, which is out on the way. And that was a bit of a gift because he doesn't have to go that way. And I sent him, I said, all right, tomorrow, go the other way. There, and then cross over to the road there. And he rang me up and he said, really weird. He said, I never even got a craving on my way to work this morning. And that was because he'd anchored that roundabout, stopping yeah. at that roundabout to lighten up his cigarette in his car. I suppose so that's, that's like people get up, at, people that <clears throat> that smoke a lot and get up in the morning and the first thing they do is have a cigarette, yeah, have a, a cup of coffee with them. Yeah, uh, they could uh, they could at doing it because they've practiced it for years. A pint of beer in the pub. Yeah, whiskey. Or that's a, that's an interesting point you've just touched on there. Um, the the pint in the pub scenario. <clears throat> How do you deal with the um, that really strong temptation of when somebody's out with their mates and their mates all go outside for a fag and they're sat there on their own because that's that's <coughs> got that's got to be a real test for a oh, for, is, for a smoker is. that's got to be the acid test when well, all the boys have gone outside for a fag and all the boys are out there having a laugh and having a ciggy and they're not but you've got to take it back yeah the reason for smoking yeah the social anxiety okay so they've linked the cigarette gives them a chance to be with their mates with the cool guys or whatever the yeah. big boys around the back of the bike sheds with the big girls so we can't be sexist or the big general gender neutrals even yeah. just to cover all <laughs> angles or the small <laughs> gender neutrals to be out with them there's nothing stopping them going outside and having a chat with their mates at the pub now because they don't need the cigarette they've already got their friends that one has gone out the window you see so once again with the hypnosis and hypnotherapy it will be that if somebody else smokes that is their choice you do not want to try and stop somebody smoking or anything like that that will be their choice but it's not your choice you choose not to smoke it doesn't matter in the least you can go out there and talk to them if somebody just says Come on, you know you want a fag, just say, no, thank you, I'm a non-smoker. 
and it becomes quite easy when it's their choice because yeah. as an adult you understand choices people may have friends that smoke illegal substances or do other stupid things or there but they realize that's their choice if you've got a friend that always drives home from the pub after four or five pints yeah it's his choice it's not something you do you know you choose yeah. to ha- yeah, and have when you put it in that context, a pint, of shandy, a pint of shandy or something, or, or drink soft drinks in a, if you know you're driving. So it's not your choice. So the same with the smoking. And I also do actually try and generate a hate for the cigarette, not the smoker. So it's observing what the damage the cigarette has done to people. Um, they may be wheezing and coughing and gasping for one. Maybe with women, women seem to be more than men, so that it deteriorates the skin on their face. So sure it ages, ages yeah. them, things like that. Getting them to observe that and hate what the cigarette has done to that person or what it's doing to them. You know, the fact that, I mean, in my own case, when I gave up, I was 30 when I gave up. I had actually run for Berkshire when I was 18 and always considered myself pretty fit and healthy and I at the time was working for a transport company and used to smoke more out of boredom on the motorways and things. Had another guy that was quite a bit bigger than me, um, he smoked just as much and I can't remember what happened but I upset him and he chased me up the yard and when I say up the yard we are talking probably 75 yards yeah. tops. We couldn't have a punch up because we both collapsed in a heap. Right. And I just sat there and thought, Jesus, what has this stuff done to me? And the following morning, I made up my mind, I'm giving up. And I cycled to work. It was a nice summer's day. It was about a six-mile cycle ride, two big hills. Never got off the bike once. I put up both hills there. But we used to, it's a little company. If we weren't working immediately, we'd have a cup of coffee with the boss in his front room. And I was sat in the front room with this cup of coffee and the room was literally going around my head. <laughs> with oxygen. Like, yeah, it just reinforced it. God, what a state I've got in. And I did have some hypnosis tapes and they were cassette tapes in those wow. days. Old things. Um, and yeah, doing it sort of cold turkey and with some rather naff tapes. It was a little bit, of, it wasn't that difficult, but there was a little bit of a struggle. But once I got my brain around hating it, and I used to just yeah. remember seeing in the high street a clapped out fiesta with this old boy with a fag hanging out the window. Yeah. And I, I just sort of thought, silly old Ford, didn't smoke, he could afford a decent car. Yeah. The fact that I was driving a clapped out Capri at the time yeah. didn't matter. I'm just trying to get my head around yeah. making sure that yeah. I don't smoke again. Yeah. Changing and, the context of the future smoker you didn't want to become. Yeah, and pretty soon after, I got money in my pocket. Yeah. The clapped out Capri did actually go. Yeah. I think it got replaced by clapped out Audi. <laughs> a bit more like market. Yeah. Um, but I actually had money. And it's surprising how then I used to reward myself. I would sort of chuck the money in a jar and then go out at the weekend or something. Yeah. And it might have only been out for a few bag of fish and chips but it was something as a reward I'm very similar to that <coughs> you notice it yeah so it doesn't bother me in the least if somebody <coughs> lights up next to me yeah so i know one of the common things <coughs> that um i remember when I, I i did some training and i've got mixed feelings about it that's the old hospital bed sketch where they're in hypnosis and the client they see themselves and they're in the hospital bed and their family's gathered round and they're all upset and there's the beep beep of the heart monitor and the heart monitor stops and they're dead and the family are all crying and this is what happens if you keep smoking well i don't quite do that it like that i do do that sometimes yeah normally for a second visit okay a revisit normally because yeah. um, the thought i had was which somebody suggested to me is one thing that is going to make somebody dash out after the session and have a cigarette is if is if they're in if they're in peril if they're scared if they're like what the hell's going on here they don't do it quite like i need a fag don't do it quite like that yeah once again i credit the person who gave it to me it's bob burns 
Uh huh. It is a, de a sort of deathbed sketch, but you need a person with some sort of family for starters for it to ever work. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because you're not playing on so much their emotions, but it's sort of like, say, you've got um, somebody with a family that's perhaps still got their mother or father alive, got a wife alive, got a couple of little kids. Yeah. And here, the deathbed scene is you're lying in hospital, there's pipes going in every orifice and a few others that you didn't even know you had. Um, the family is sat around the end of the bed. There and there's little Janie and James, you know, just six years old or whatever. Yeah. There's another, every one of them's got tears. And then I say, and now I want you to do something for me because I simply cannot do this. You have got to explain to them why, through your own selfishness, you are depriving them of a father, a son, and a granddad, whatever, a daughter, yeah. or whatever, all of those. And now, you explain and then there's silence from my side you let them explain and we do quite often get tears at this point yeah i'm not surprised yeah, there are tears it's it's not frightening them in the same way it's not there but it's just actually making them see that the effects of their smoking could have on their family and their children as i say the guy that rang up and said told me that he's Father died when he was six, and now his son was six. Yeah. It was the easiest one to do. Yeah. Never actually did that scenario with him, didn't need to. Yeah. In any way, shape, or form, because he'd already basically come in saying it in the first place. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, we use that one certainly on a second appointment if somebody does come back. Because sometimes, um, once again, I've had this guy stopped smoking for about three weeks. Then he's involved in a car crash and somebody offered him a fag and he just took one. Yeah. Autopilot. Um, you know, if he hadn't had the car crash, he probably never would have um, had the cigarette. We don't know. But um, if you haven't got any cigarettes about you, it's a bit difficult to smoke. Yeah. Unless somebody gives you one. And this is just, let's say, responding to a car crash. So when you've, when you've given them the time to have that conversation with the, their devastated family at the end of the bed, you let the process and let me know when you're ready to move on, they give you a response, where do you go from there? Um, well, then we have the nice scenario. Because I always say to the people, I want to give you two scenarios for this deathbed scene. The first one is the deathbed scene. We've made them really play with guilt and all sorts of things. Yeah. And I said there was another, but I did say there were two scenarios. Now I want you to see you to have you in your favourite place, sort of walking down the beach, swinging little Janie and James or wherever the kids were. Yeah. Um, in your arms and a really wonderful scene of happiness and they're all smiling at you and they're so grateful that you took this wonderful choice today and you're feeling fantastic in taking that choice. And what they do sometimes ask them which scenario they want, although it's usually fairly obvious. Yeah. Um, to take. So you're also giving them the opportunity to end the session on a high. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Rather yeah. than just leaving them with that that lingering peril of them gasping in a hospital bed. Well, you see, it's like you're leaving them a high, but it's, it's also the same thing as going back to um, when I said about stopping them smoking against starting them uh, smoking. Yeah. Most people try and stop people doing something that they've enjoyed doing for years. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas I'm trying to stop somebody starting something that they know they didn't like in the first place. Yeah. And I think psychologically that's much easier. I like that. Much, much easier to stop somebody doing something that they know they didn't like in the first place than stop something that they've enjoyed for. Yeah. Great way of putting it. Years and so years. your your intake form then obviously you know you need to know who's who's at the end of the deathbed you need to yeah. know you know I don't I don't actually have that on my intake form but what I do is I turn it over and write notes on the back and I say yes. like, hey, have you got any family oh you've got kids how old are they what are they daughters boys um, you know is your mum still alive is your dad still alive are they in good health no my dad's wheezing away he smokes as well really <laughs> yeah. Um, now, of course, there is a slight problem that the dad may be years older than him, 
and still alive. Yeah. So well, my, yeah, my dad's ninety seven. Um, well, it is actually true that the oldest person in Europe, or the oldest recorded person, um, was a, a French lady called Jean Calmet, and she smoked till she was something like one hundred and seventeen. There's um, always one. Well, there is. There's always the exception that proves the rule, so to speak. Uh, it's like 97%, I think, is the figure of lung cancers are caused by smoking. But there's still 3% that aren't. Yeah. So there's still Murphy's Law yeah. that can get you. Um, but the overwhelming statistics show that if you give up smoking, your chances of living longer just rocket. Yeah. Um, See, everybody knows this. Yeah. So what is it that's stopping somebody from just saying, I'm never going to have another cigarette? Subconscious. We all know, um, you know, we all know what we should do, but subconscious has got a different agenda. And we fall into that with all sorts of things. Um, you know, a phobia or something like that, or something stupid. You know, when you get a phobia of um, something completely harmless. I, I've actually had a phobia of custard. Somebody was mentioning yesterday on the course that had a phobia of lemons, I think it was. Lemons? Yeah, I've had oranges, actually. Um, there, yeah, just the feel of the fruit or whatever, just couldn't touch it. These sort of things, totally irrational. Consciously, you know that even spiders in the UK, they're not going to kill you. Yeah. There. But people will run a mile from them. So it's a subconscious problem. It's inside them. They can't so this control. is where the, um, I explain, because I do quite a lot with weight loss, and the clients have already been through the, the, the willpower thing, you know, the, the trying thing. And I explain to them that, you know, if you've got, that much brain power or that much capacity in your brain or or processing ability or whatever that much of it is the conscious bit that does the thinking and all of that is the subconscious so you've got five percent your willpower bit you've got five percent battling against 95 percent and that's only ever going to end one way that's one man against an army yeah well i explain it slightly differently but i usually go for the nlp thing of you can hold in your conscious mind seven plus or minus two. And I'm a little bit of a joke, so I say if you're a bit thick, it's only five. If you're a bit intelligent, it's nine. Yeah. I do put the bit thick first and so that I can go on to the intelligent bit because they give a funny look sometimes when you get yeah. a bit thick. <laughs> um, but I say subconsciously, you deal with somewhere in the region of 2.3 million bits of information every second. Um, and I often explain the subconscious, I sort of, sort of say things like, when you go back to your car, your legs will just work. You'll make a conscious decision and your legs will just work. You don't think about all the muscles you've got to contract and relax. Um, while we're on the subject of subconscious, I often describe it actually, um, using metaphors and things, as like a, a big cruise ship or a big ship. And some of these big Royal Caribbean and Princess Liners, you know, they hold about 5,000 people. I say they're in the docks, you know, Newcastle or Southampton or wherever. And they're full up, and there's some guy at the top who gives the command, which is basically to be effective, let's take us out to sea, lads. And the moment he issues that command, a whole lot of things go on underneath him. People running down the docks, taking off the ropes other guys winding them in, um, the engine starting up, the navigation going into order, yeah. and everything starts up. So the captain, that's your conscious mind, all the crew and all the rest, the hospitality and stuff, is the subconscious. But sometimes to get out of a dock, they need another guy. They have to take on a pilot who knows how to get them out of the dock. So they take on a pilot. Beep. I am nice. your pilot. I will get off when you're going in the right direction. I like that. Did you come up with that whole on your own? <laughs> After a cruise, yeah. <laughs> After a cruise, brilliant. Um, but yeah, the pilot gets on the boat, guides them out, and then another boat comes alongside and he jumps off it. Because he doesn't really want to go on a cruise around the Mediterranean or the Norwegian fjords. He's already been there. 
Um, so what advice would you give to the therapists who shy away from smoking because? Because there's a million reasons why therapists shy away. There's, there's their, I think a lot of it is the, the therapist's own fear of failure because smoking is kind of stigmatised in the industry that, oh, it's difficult and, oh, you can't do it and, oh, you'll, you'll get lots of client fails and you'll get complaints and you'll get bad reviews. There's that whole bundle there. And then you've got the therapists who have dipped their toe in the water, so to speak. They've had a, a client fail and they then run a mile. Yeah. Well, probably if you have uh, the average therapist, if you had a number, a pound for every time they heard something like, oh, I spent £150 on giving up smoking and then had a fag in the car park afterwards, you'd be rich. Um, this is people not really understanding it. They're often not even hypnotizing their clients. They just relax a therapy, uh, relax a therapy. Um, telling them they're a non-smoker. Yeah, it works sometimes. Everything works sometimes. Um, there, but it doesn't have a very high rate. This is people who haven't really gone into it and understood the smoker. I think in some cases, a smoker is actually better at understanding themselves than other people. Mm -hmm. um, I might argue that for alcoholics, the trouble is they don't tend to make very good hypnotherapists. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, you have to expect some failure. There are people that boast 95% success rate. Usually those are people that, are, such as me, that offer a free reset if they go back to smoking within a certain period of time. These people never come back to them, so they assume it's worked. And I have had people from other therapists come to me and say that, yeah, they were offered a free retest, and they, the person has been afraid to go back and admit failure to that hypnotherapist, so they've, right. come, they've come to a different one. They've yeah. found another one. And in paid the again. And paid again because it might be they've given up for a year they would probably have to pay again with the other person but yeah um they're afraid to go back and admit that so i am quite suspicious of the, the 95 percent so i'd probably yeah. get about 80 percent which i think is as high as it's there but there the, are the reasons success people... of your 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 80 percent margin is that you have that client selection process. Yeah. So if you were just taking on everybody, like the ones who say, can you make me stop smoking? Well, no, I can't. So you don't even, so you're, you're cutting out already, you're cutting out say 30% of people who are born, born to fail. Yeah, but I mean, if somebody comes to you to give up smoking, there's part of them at any rate that wants to give up. Usually. Yeah. Now, uh, we don't do sort of ones like, oh, I've got a new girlfriend and she says, I smell a cigarette. No. New girlfriend, she might, she might be pissed off with him smelling a cigarette and leave him a week later. Yeah. Oh, great, I can't find it again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're, you're a hard man. Just those people look at, there has to be some sort of commitment there, um, but it doesn't have to be that massive because I think, if somebody phones you up and says, and it's them phones and says, I want to give up smoking, there's part of them that wants to give up. Yeah. So, because now we're into parts therapy, really. Yeah. Which in some way we're using quite a lot, but we just don't call it parts therapy or smoking. There's nothing to stop you using that. Find the part that doesn't want to give up. Find why it doesn't want to give up. Solve that one's problem and you'll probably do it. Give it a new role. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not really into NLP and all this integrate the parts. And yeah. One in one hand and put your hands together and they've integrated. <laughs> no, and, uh, not me. Um, no doubt some people can do it, I can't. Uh, yeah, but you're starting with the premises, pardon me, once it's like, it's like, and then if they come in and say, bet you can't hypnotize me, it's sort of like, well, what are you doing here? Yeah. In See, the, I was slightly in different with the approach with those, those clients. Ones who say, I hear it quite a lot actually. Um, 
whether they're anxious because that they don't know what hypnosis is because you haven't got mm -hmm. to that bit yet or whatever. So when I get my stock answer, and feel free to steal any of this, my stock answer is really simple. If, if you came to me and you said, I don't think I can be hypnotized, I just said, my answer is, okay then, I won't hypnotize you, I'll just talk to you. Yeah, I, I, and that also disarms the, the really controlling people, the people who say they can't be hypnotized because they're used to being in control. You know, the guy who's the managing director of Rio Tinto and, you know, the world at his feet. And... Well, I, I, I often say to them, great. I go, it's a slightly different word, very much the same. Great, I hear that loads of times. But you'd also be surprised how many people just slip in, into hypnosis and there's no point in sort of just guessing around, why don't we just try something? Why don't we just do something silly or something like that? So I actually sort of like, and then very often that is where the swan will catch people out. Yeah. Um, Some people, sportsmen especially, sort of things that sort of come with, they've got an anxiety block to get onto the next mm. thing. So it might be a boxer or something like that who actually thinks they're consciously quite in control. And when they're sat there and their hands moving around or waving at them like this, yeah. they are usually... Ooh. Now... Of course, with the swan, very often the instruction is, I don't want you to, give, uh, to go into hypnosis. It's not hypnosis. I don't want you to go into hypnosis. But hang on a minute, it's got all the elements of it. Yeah. It has all the elements of it. And I actually think that when that instruction is given, once again, it's, a, it's that don't word that sits in there, take yeah. it out, I want you to go into hypnosis. Um, but either way, if somebody is actually not moving their hand consciously and it's waving at them, it's pretty spectacular and pretty convincing too, isn't it? that something's gone on. I mean, there's a lot of other things that you can do. I mean, um, but a lot of the other things, well, even the swan is a risk. Of not, sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, I don't know why. Um, it's probably something I say because the more I've learned about it, the more successful it's got. So it probably is down to how one deals with it but uh, but yeah well, anything you, fails you are the therapist for whom uh, it, when you use the blueprint you're the only therapist I've spoken to for whom sometimes the birds don't fly away I don't know how you achieve that maybe you would <laughs> but then the other day for the very first time I had somebody who couldn't find a pebble couldn't find a pebble. No, I don't think I've ever had somebody who couldn't find a pebble. I haven't before. And I must have done, I don't know how many thousands of blueprint sessions I've done in its many guises, you know, whether it's the blueprint or whether it's the island or a mix of both. I, I've never had a client who couldn't find a pebble. You see, the birds thing started. So this is why I do it with things from the island, because you can, you can probably adapt the blueprint anyway, but it's just my nature of thinking. Had somebody and the birds in the trees, I, I tell them to imagine clapping their hands loudly so the birds fly yeah. away. And of course, your island's got a cat, hasn't it? Well, this is where, this is where <laughs> it actually came from, you see. It didn't have beforehand. Um, the birds flew away, but then this woman, um, her face seemed to say she was struggling. There's something yeah. just not quite right about her. And so I actually said, have all the birds flown? And she said, yes, but there's a bloody great vulture, I think black vulture, staring at me in the tree. So the light, and you're sitting there thinking, it's a curved ball coming, because it's certainly not in the blueprint script. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, what's this mean? It's a bird. You know, so there's a, there's a very fast thought going on here. Yeah. It's a bird. I've instructed her to put birds in the trees. But this is a big black vulture that's staring at her. Yeah. It's something to do with one of her issues that's not very nice and it doesn't yeah. want to fly. Yeah. Now, because it's the first thing, I mean, some other people have said to me, probably you, perhaps you would leave that and do that again on the second one. But once again, thinking process, I've only got a few seconds. So my thought was, I said, you may not have noticed, but you've got Tiger, the island cat, sat behind you. He's a big ginger, mangy, moldy, and he absolutely loves eating birds. 
send him after that one. I said, one of two Very things nice. will happen. It'll either fly yeah. away or he'll eat it. And I go a few moments and sort of like, what's it done? Yeah, it's flown off. And he's now sat in the tree like the Cheshire cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is such missing. a great comeback. I love it. You, <laughs> where did you, of course, you've got cats, so I suppose. No, no, I'm a cat, not cats. Yeah. Um, but it's just... That's why I like the island, because I can instantly introduce almost anything. Anything at all. Out there. Um, and so even to the extent of, as you well know, one time I actually screwed up the blueprint one time. Yeah. Um, I'd gone into the, the tunnels with the, where the future pacing is in effect. Gone into the doors and stuff like that, and then suddenly thought, oh, hell, I forgot to do the birds. But just come out the other end of the tunnel, there's a path down to the lake with the, where the pebbles are. But it goes through some green fields, and in the first green field on the right, there's this big tree where the grass is blowing in the breeze, and there's some birds in it. So, and the funny thing is, is that I actually think now that by doing the future pacing first, you're actually telling the subconscious what to get rid of, what birds to put in the tree. That's actually my thought, whether it's right or wrong. Um, I think it's, it's actually really effective putting the future pacing first and I've experimented with that myself because the way it's worded in the blueprint is this is you after you have released anything or everything that you no longer need and is holding you back so you have definitely you've set the stage for for building that association whether it's in the birds or with the pebble or the paper boats in the island or yeah that's a great way to go on so that's actually that all came about by a complete cock up um, yeah <laughs> but then you learn by your mistakes yeah and so actually making mistakes so this comes back to the smoking thing you don't learn anything you see if, if my objective was to pick up this cup and drink your tea which is yeah. a bit cold but never mind i like cold tea i haven't learned anything by picking up that cup yeah there but if i picked it up and the handle fell off yeah or I knocked it over while picking it up. By actually making mistakes, that's how everybody learns. Great yeah. footballers, they don't learn anything by kicking the ball in the net on a penalty. They learn something when the, when the goalkeeper saves it. Yeah. Um, everything like that, everything in life, you learn from your mistakes. Yeah. So the thing is, is, therapists were afraid to make a mistake. Yeah. Whereas I'm not afraid. If somebody genuinely doesn't give up smoking, we said, don't tell this and this at the start, but they will be sent their money back. Yeah. The worst one I ever heard, I think the only thing that I've ever heard that it's, we all fluff up our words or something like that from time to time. Any therapist that says they do it perfectly, all of, did you enjoy that? Yeah. I like your pink cup, by the way. Um, was, <laughs> sure. I had a client came to me for anxiety and lots of, lots of you will have heard this already if you've done the blueprint training. And her previous therapist, um, the client went in and the therapist, uh, the, the supposed therapist, and it is another therapist here in sunny Lincoln, and the therapist said, oh, you know, why are you here? I'm here for anxiety. So the therapist took a book from the shelf, went to the index, anxiety, page 82, turned to page 82 or whatever, said, okay, close your eyes, started reading the anxiety script, and actually read out the words, and now you're feeling so relaxed, insert client name. Yes, not very professional. That's the worst thing in the world. So I think on, on you that... see even the lines there, and now you're feeling so relaxed. Yeah. That their brain can say, actually, I'm not. No, it doesn't work with me. I'm it doesn't work with me. I remember being on a course and somebody was was talking at me about how relaxed I was and how much more relaxed I was. And the more they told me I was relaxed, the, the more wound up I was. And in the end, I opened my eyes and went, look, you might as well pack it in. And I wasn't being mean. I played the game for, for long enough. They could obviously see that I was getting tense. So they picked up on that. But the more tense I appeared, the more, the more they told me I was relaxed. No, change direction, adapt and overcome. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that. That's what happens, you see, with the island. And uh, yes, it's a whole load of little scripts. 
but they're only samples. They're methods. Yeah. So, you know, there is no one way that if somebody comes in with anxiety, um, you don't have a sort of like go to here, go to there, across to there, around to there, and up there. Yeah. Um, you don't have that. I mean, part of it is anxiety is um, just a word. I mean, what are they anxious about? Have they got general anxiety disorder? Have they got social anxiety? Have mm. they got an interview coming up that's temporary? Have they got performance anxiety, which might lead to things like erectile dysfunction and stuff yeah. like that? Um, you don't know actually what anxiety they've got. Yeah. So then you adapt to things. It may be that they worry that they get angry all the time. There's a place on the island for anger. Yeah. It's not one I'd normally use, but if they, if that's what they say, yeah, then we go to that. It's like the treasure chest. I've used it for absolutely all sorts. Yeah, you don't and, have and you can. You don't have to put A, B, or C in the in that chest. You can put absolutely anything. I mean, the only one thing that probably isn't the most uniform thing I have on the island is actually the waterfall, and that is. Yeah. On my intake form, and everybody should have one of this, a question of this, have you been sexually abused? When I was advised to put it on there, I, the person who advised me to put it on there, I said to them, I said, yeah, no, you'll answer it. I was told I'd be surprised. Yeah. Probably why they're a mentor and I'm not, I was maybe right. Yeah. Very surprised, especially with weight loss, especially with anxiety, and especially women. Yeah. As you know, all of my clients are female. They are aged 40 to 48. Um, they tend to be single, divorced, separated. This is a broad brush definition. And I never ask. I actually don't ask. I used to ask, and I don't now. But still, 70 to 80% of my clients, often not maybe not the first session, volunteer the information that they have been sexually abused, raped, molested in some way. And that's without asking. I'm getting 70 to 80 percent of that that social demographic um, who are volunteering that information. Now, like, they just tick a box on mine. So, yes. OK. I never even mention it to them. I look through the thing. I just ignore it. But one of the common things with sexual abuse is that people say it made them feel dirty. Yeah. And so I take them to the waterfall. I don't explain why. I don't do anything like that. I just take them to the waterfall and then it's just I'm the only person on the island. So there's this lovely inviting water. It's a hot day. The water's just refreshingly right. So you can go in and have a shower and you can notice all these black blotches of all what time was given you. I don't even mention that they come from abuse. Yeah. Of them. Yeah. Let them build just that association. Dirt. There, and the waterfall, there's a magic waterfall. It washes off all these black bl blotches. It restores your skin to clean and pure. Yeah, clean and pure, yeah, baby like. Um, there, the water starts off black around your feet. It gradually goes to brown and then it runs clear, and that river just takes it all away. And then we take them out and then we go off somewhere else. Which might be a blueprint, it might be down to the beach to meet a guide, it might be yeah, up to the cliffs to lob somebody off or whatever. Um, and the number of people I, afterwards, because I just have a short debrief, like was there anybody on the cliffs to chuck off or did you manage to make a guide, you know, don't tell me what it was or did you put anything in the treasure chest. And the number of people say, I really love that waterfall. Yeah. I find it really, really. You know, it's done something. Don't know what. You don't have to ask him. It's content free. Remember. Sometimes I tell you. Yeah. Um, but it just covers the base in that what they've come to you might be related to the sexual abuse. But yeah. It might not be. So we're not going to get them to relive it. But we're going to no. try and clean it out. Yeah. If it's a problem and it doesn't do any harm, what's the worst that can come from it? Of going and having a wash in the shower. Yeah. The worst is it didn't do anything. That's yeah. the worst. The best is it could have content free, yeah, removed one of their blocks in life. Yeah. So removed the emotional ties. I, I had um one of my ladies a few only a few weeks ago came to me specifically for 
the, the bad things that had happened in her childhood. And she believed that's why she was really, really anxious as an adult. So she, she didn't want to talk. I said, I explained that you, you don't have to tell me. She said, you know, thank goodness she'd been down the talking therapy route. And she, I did the blueprint with her. So it was session one, did the blueprint. And she only lives about 600 meters from where we're sat now. And we did the blueprint, she left, and she realized in, in the time it took her to get home, she realized that the problem was not what was driving the anxiety, wasn't what had happened to her as a child. It was her narcissistic husband. And it, she went home, walked in the door, and then now separated. Yeah, so now we've got a job with marriage guidance. 